Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Faith Church Podcast. I am your host, Jay Williams. Joining me today is Christoph Katzbeck. Hey, Jay. I tried to put... You, boy, you really jumped in there. Yeah. I, was, I barely even said the K of Katzbeck, and you were really in... Just, just excited to be here. You're just so excited. I'm just, I'm just excited to be Chomping here. at the bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chomping at the bit. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah, we had a great we had a great Thanksgiving. I think like a lot of the um a lot of the people in our church, we we it, it sounds like at least we had um just kind of like colds hit our family. <laughs> so we were we were battling with uh head colds and like what are we going to do? What are we not going to do? And it ended up being nice. It ended up being a little bit more low key. Um, but, uh, I think one of the highlights for me was just that we ended up like kind of having three mini Thanksgivings in terms of like family. Mm -hmm. We had like the main Thursday Thanksgiving with some family. And then Friday we did like leftovers and that became like a Thanksgiving meal. And then Saturday we drove down to Appleton, uh, to go visit Max and Sharice and did a little Thanksgiving meal with them. And it was, so it was cool. It was, it was full and and I, I liked it. So how was yours? Uh, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I'm curious when you said Friday is like a Thanksgiving meal to me, the best meal is Friday lunch. Yeah. The, the leftovers. Yeah, I love that. But we didn't do like your, I feel like when you say leftovers, you think of like turkey sandwiches, you think of like taking what you made and you use a different Don't vehicle. Tell me what I think. I, it's just what I'm, th- what, what I like so imagine. You th- so we, we didn't do that though. We just did like straight up same plates of food. Yeah. I yeah. do the same thing. Did you? Okay. Yeah. That's Friday. I don't do like the sandwich thing. I, some That's usually a Friday dinner. Okay. But Friday lunch is all the things that like I just recreate whatever I made on Thursday. So let me, 2.0. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you this. So it's Friday. Imagine it's Friday. What's the, don't slurp in the, what are you a slurp. rookie? I didn't slurp. Or we'll take a poll oh, that people goodness. heard right. slurping. I did not I, slurp. Like the wave form. I'm looking at the wave form. There was You're looking slurp. at a lot of waveforms. Yeah, but the slurp was obvious. Um, all right. So if I can... Oh, amateurs. Um, the <laughs> if, if you're on Friday, what is the item that if it's not there for leftovers, you're sad? Like what's the... That's a good question. Two, two immediately come to mind, and they're the same color. Well, they're, oh, that's like everything on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> sweet potatoes and uh, pumpkin pie. Sweet potatoes and pumpkin pie. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, if that's that, if that's there, you're okay with leftovers. Yeah. Like, whatever. But if those aren't there, you're like, oh. Probably a little disappointed. Happened? Yeah. What happened to those? Yeah. Yeah. For me, thanks for asking. Um, it's green bean casserole, I would say. Oh, man, I cannot stand green bean casserole. I can't. <laughs> I actually got a phone call. So Thursday morning, I go to the gym. And I feel like I'm, you're interrupting mine, but I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I, well, it's just, it relates to green bean casserole. Yeah, I, and, and if I get an opportunity to throw my brother-in-law under the bus, I'm going to do it. Um, Did anybody notice a slurp there? That's how you drink okay. coffee in a podcast. Like I'm anyways, literally right by the microphone. Anyways... Thursday, get done working out, and I get and like I had everything planned, especially after your you message. Took another sip. I think it was like a week and a half ago. You need to calm down. A week and a half, a week and a half ago, I think you had mentioned something about not shopping on Thanksgiving. Am I imagining that? I did say that. Yeah. You did, you did, and I, I was, I was, I felt so prepared. I was like, okay, we don't need to do anything. I specifically asked Sarah on Wednesday, and as I'm coming back home from the gym, um, my brother-in-law knows that I am coming back, and he calls me, and I'm like a block away from home, and he goes, "Hey, are you out and about?" Like, are you, are you going to make, are you going to make me go to the stores? I need French fried onions for the green bean casserole. It's like, oh, so not only did I have to go to the store, but I had to go and get like an ingredient for a food that so let me is just like say, the worst. Let me say this. There's no excuse for not having those ready. Cause that should be front. Like, would you forget? That would be like somebody calling you and saying, Ooh, are you out and about? Could you stop and get a turkey? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. It is Thank so. You. Yes. It is so. French fried onions for the green bean casserole is so critical. Yeah. That it's like forgetting the turkey. Yeah. Yeah. You said you didn't like green bean casserole. I don't, but I know that it's a thing. I like. So I'm saying that's first and foremost. However, if you found on Thanksgiving morning that you had forgotten to get a turkey, then you have no choice but to get it. You got to get Same it. Same way yeah, French fried yeah, onions. You yeah. can't. So the, the fried onions on there, yeah. That's, that's why I went. I went, so. Those are the, that for me, so back to the back original to you. Yeah, question. Yeah. 
goodness. Green bean casserole. The green bean casserole and and uh I would say normally stuffing, but um but really green bean casserole and jello salad. Ooh, yeah. But it's my family's recipe jello salad. Right, right of course. Which is kind of course. weird. And Lauren What flavor jello? Um it's like strawberry jello with strawberries in it and okay. applesauce basically. Yeah. Is what this what it's made of. And Lauren thought it was weird when she first made it. And uh, there's also a cranberry thing. I don't like cranberry sauce, but I do like we make this fluffy. We. <laughs> it's a, it's <laughs> a careful. corporate. It's a corporate of course, effort. Yeah, yeah. Team effort. Know. Yeah. Team effort. Um, someone makes like a whip. There is food. Like a whipped cream, cranberry, fluffy marshmallow thing that is really good. Okay. I That's can like see that. That's like the only, I think it's cran- The wait, only vehicle by which you like cranberries? cranberries? Maybe it's not cranberries. Hey, okay. Question about the green bean casserole really quick, more. and then we should really like oh, should we, get yeah, on track. Go ahead. Uh, do you are you one of those people who like it cold or do you warm it up? Um, I prefer it warm. Okay. I mean, here's the key. the The bummer is whenever you microwave it, it's it loses a little bit of something, the right? Crisp, yeah. You know, from so you can sprinkle some more of the the French, French fried onions. onions on yeah. It. Um, but no, I like it. I like it heated. It, it, so this was like the act of, of love and sacrifice for my son was he also loves it. Like Silas loves the green bean casserole. We're the two that love it. Yeah. And I saved the last bit for him. Ugh, what a good dad. And he, and, and he appreciated it. It was like, I couldn't, I Get couldn't have bought, I couldn't have bought him a better Christmas present. Like it, it was full appreciation mm-hmm. of the. Of the magnitude of the moment, you could so. make a Hallmark movie on that. Well, call we could. it like the green bean casserole. I like. saw a creative Hallmark movie over the weekend too. Really? Yeah. Well, one. I mean, well, oh, it, it's funny. It was based on real events actually, so it went off Hallmark script. They they tried to steer it back and make it kind of more Hallmarky, but it was uh, it was interesting. We we need to get moving. Man. Anyways, this is another, anyway, this is another long one <laughs> of Thanksgiving. So, you know, it'd be interesting. I wish if we took live calls right now, we would say, what, what, what's the leftover caller? What's your, makes, makes your Friday lunch that without it, you're like, "Mm, why bother? You're going to get people like filling out in the communication cards. That would like, but the so great (laughs) communication cards. I would love that just for like live polling. So so Leslie goes through the communication cards at staff meeting. If people just wrote down, that was it. I, just want to see her facial expression. She's so good. She's got a So stack. here's the thing. Leslie doesn't listen to the podcast. No. She barely listens to me on a daily basis. So she's certainly not listening to a recorded version of me. But since she wouldn't hear this, that's what I'm going to ask. Next next week at worship on Sunday, fill out a communication card and put on put your favorite leftover, like your favorite Thanksgiving dish leftover. Just so I can experience Leslie going, why Why do I have a card that says dressing? Why do I have a yeah. card that says mashed potatoes? Why? What? I don't understand. It'd be yeah, so great. That'd be great. Anyway, speaking of favorites, we just finished uh, favorites. James. Listen, I'm the transition guy here. Well, you weren't transitioning, <laughs> so I was trying to help you out here. Um. Yeah, James. So we wrapped up James. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. It was. I was and not really... that the sermon is great, but it was fun to wrap up. It was fun to wrap up James. I just went totally like big picture on it and just thought I'd throw a bunch of for Sunday. Yeah, for Sunday yeah. that was tough because it was like I thought. Well, I wanted to do a recap, and then I decided to do a recap where I just quoted a bunch of James yeah. because I think there's something powerful when you realize, hey, this is clearly like these are major themes in James that he read. You know, he addresses over and over and over again. Yeah, we were we were talking before we turned on the pod, turned on the mics about what kind of our favorite or what our takeaways, I guess, were from James, because I I feel like um, whenever we finish a sermon series, there's kind of like this, like, I don't know if you have this moment of just kind of reflecting back on the messages and reflecting back on kind of studying through it and thinking through and um and I was, I was really like, I, I thought your message did a great job of articulating what I felt like God had really impressed on me over the last couple of months of how, how James is like really this, like this letter to the church. Uh, cause I, I think I've always read it as like this, like specifically to me, I've read it very selfishly and instead of the grander picture of like the church together collectively being, um, this group that reflect who Jesus called us to be. And I think James really captured that 
and I like that to me was one of those just it really stood out to me throughout the whole the whole message the whole series I think that's I think that's one of those cultural things that we don't realize how strange that would be to the original authors I mean you have to remember these are these are letters that are read all at once to a group of people they don't have individual copies for themselves they aren't all taking it home and doing individual studies with it. So it's primarily meant for a corporate audience. Yeah, the collective, the church, yeah, right. the body, yeah. Yeah, I think so. And and I feel it's a weird tension though because there are there are certainly when you read through it like, you know, we're going through prayer and it's like, yeah, you individually do need to Sure. Spend time in prayer. But then as you read through it again, you're like, well, we like we as a body, like what what good would it be if, you know, you're thinking of a body if just the finger did what the finger was supposed to do. But the elbow, you know, wasn't moving. It would it would be weird. And like that is I don't know. I agree. That is definitely a I don't know. It's a it's a it's a cultural thing that we, we struggle with. Yeah. And when we struggle with that, then it it loses a lot of the meaning really like it it does a couple of things one is it makes us very um we lose the one another's we lose the whole point that we are to meant to stir one another up to good works that we're supposed to hold one another accountable we're supposed to encourage one another all those different things that we are meant to do together as a community but we also lose the the power and the joy of the communal effect of this um but it also like it just it allows us to interpret things in really strange ways you know like we can it allows us to more easily kind of explain away a verse or ignore something or whatever because right oh that's not that's not an issue for me or whatever and we don't think about it as a as a collective like whether it's um whether it's prayer or um you know warnings or cautions that James gives or the the push for caring for the widows and the orphans or whatever the case is like we just we just miss out on so much when we make it very um when we over personalize it 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 is like you said it is personal but it's personal then as a part of a collective so yeah so let me ask you this because th- those last two verses uh James 5:19 through 20 you could you could have gone the route of very personal right so the whole concept was hey if you see a brother or sister wandering, go and restore them. Like go, you know, and like you, you, you said, you, you started Sunday morning, you, you, you talked about that and then you transitioned towards the greater responsibility for one another as a whole, rather than just these two people going like we together have this responsibility and in like when we act this way, this is when we are salt and light. This is when we are um, like, what, 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 caused you to say that's the direction I want to go in with this wrap up rather than just sticking to the idea of well it could have just been a message about um, you know holding someone accountable it could have just been a message about um, calling someone else's sin instead there was a greater I, I, I don't know if this is the right word to use or not but holistic idea of like what does it mean to be the church together than just this like this small microchasm why did you go that direction I think it's so like part of my philosophy of preaching, which I'm not alone in having this philosophy of preaching. I think it's, um, I I feel like it's gone a little bit out of style, but the idea that the text says what it says and the author has a, like there, there's an intention to what is being said, but there's also an audience that is hearing it and preaching is, is, very, I mean, as you know, um, and other people may not know this, but I, I believe in the very localized uh, view of preaching that the proclamation of God's word is meant for a specific people in a specific time. And so if I did think about going down the road of, okay, what is it specifically? What does it look like to hold somebody accountable? How do you, how do you win them back? How do you like, um, you know, what is, what does that look like in a way that's not judgmental? And I could have even used that with, you know, the rest of James to inform how that would even look. And I, I did a little bit, um, but I just kept being struck with this idea that the last thing I wanted to do in a culture 
that tends to view all these things so individually. The last thing I wanted to do was give another individual example. I wanted to show how this is really about a community that is shaped by, um, shaped by the Holy Spirit, formed in, in God's revelation of himself to us, that we're formed into his image together collectively, and realizing that if we do that, like if we function in that way, that if um, then then a lot of those other things start to take care of themselves. Because the immediate thing that's going to happen when it's like, okay, well, if you if you win somebody back or if you bring them back who's wandering, there's going to first be a diffusion of responsibility, right? Like, who the, who am I who am I actually supposed to take responsibility? And it actually creates an environment where the fewer people you feel like that you're in community with, the less conviction you're going to feel about bringing somebody who's wandering back. Like, yeah, essentially I'm going to get like, if I, if I went the direction that you were talking about there, like, why didn't I do that? I think that that might hit like 5% of our congregation. You're probably going to talk about, um, an adult or a parent of an adult child who has wandered and so that would be a person who would be thinking strongly about like sure yeah how this person has wandered um you know another family member a close friend um a spouse but it's going to be somebody that you're all, that you're already thinking about like going into that and so that person doesn't really need encouragement like that person needs the encouragement of knowing this is a communal effort Right. So like you're not it's not just you going out on a seek, you know, and and search and rescue mission that that we're in this together. So that person needs to know that. And then the person who doesn't have that specific person in their life needs to realize like how they're a part of this this bigger picture and part of this greater thing. And that it's not just about their own individual faith and their own individual pursuit of Jesus that we are, that we all kind of bear responsibility. So I really wanted to take that theme of like, it's a little bit like when Jesus talks about, like when they say, who's my neighbor, it was kind of, I was kind of thinking in those terms of when, when they asked Jesus that Jesus doesn't say like, Oh, well, you know, the person that, you know, the person that, you know, that you should be loving towards. Well, that's, going to hit a very small percentage of people. Right, right. He gives an, an example and a story that awakens everyone's sense of responsibility for people around them. And so I wanted to raise, like awaken people's sense of communal responsibility, but also raise their confidence in the community to to aid in that. Does that make sense? So yeah, it both yeah. raises the, the responsibility level, but also decreases some of the personal pressure because you realize, okay, I... Like I'm calling people back into this community. I'm not, I'm not just like going and trying to fix this person's sin. Cause that's another thing that it kind of sometimes can go into is like, oh, you're doing this wrong thing. It's my job now to go and fix you and right. get you back on the straight and narrow. And that's not exactly what James is talking about. There. No, especially so. within the context of the whole, the whole book, which is, is <clears throat> where you ended up going was you know, in the context of this, like this really is a communal effort. And I, like, I think one of the things that really struck me, so I'm thinking about the person who might be listening right now and they might go like, I don't, I still don't know who that person is, or I don't feel that. And maybe I don't feel like I have those sort of people in my life who would, who would do that. You know, we, we sometimes, we sometimes get that where we have somebody who's like, Hey, I haven't been to church for a while and I haven't heard from anyone or, um, this or that. And I just, I, I'm so struck by, um, the fact that James part part of part of James is very like actionable. There's a lot of like this is what we are called to do, and I think that when we are um, on mission together, when we are God's family on mission, like we feel responsibility for one another when we are on mission together. We have a mutual uh, goal, right? We have this like mutual destination that we are trying to get to, which is you know to to glorify God, to love others, to make Him known, to live this life together. And I like, I would, I would say like, man, for, I don't, I don't know if you would agree with this or not agree with this, but I would say if you feel like you're hearing that and you're hearing part of that, like, I don't necessarily know if I have that person who I'm responsible for. I don't feel like I'm a part of a family of like, my question would be like, how are you being a part of that family? Um, how are you like, there's, there's a lot of avenues 
to, to do that, to be a part of that family. Um, what, what does that, does that make sense? Like with the, with the, the being on mission together sparks that responsibility for one another. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I guess I would say one thing to that I would say is yes. If it, if it awakens, like if you ask the question of, is there anybody in your life specifically in, in the church? So if you're part of our church, is there anybody in the church that you would say, if they wandered, I would feel a sense of responsibility to try to bring them back? Yeah, that's a good back. question. Yeah. And if there's nobody in the church that you would feel that responsibility for, then that's a problem. So that that would be one thing. But I also think it's important to realize, and this is what we talk about when we talk about in, in preaching, you know, it's not it's not a Bible study. So there are preachers out there who have the philosophy of whatever the main text, uh, main point of the passage is, that should be the main point of the sermon. And I understand that and I appreciate that style, but um, I, I think it's often used as a straw man, like against another ditch, which is the other side is the, or the, the contrast that they'll use to that is when someone uses it as like a springboard to whatever the preacher wants to talk about. So it's, you know, you could say, um, in, in this, like my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So a way of making that like the main point or like the law, like, let me say the springboard sermon on that could be like going off on a tangent about truth. Like what is, what is truth? And, and then just going through like all, you know, talking about truth that's not the main point of that Jesus is, or that James is talking about here. Um, but also though, I would say the main, the main point here is not about going and bringing someone back. The main point of these couple of verses is just talking about the seriousness of wandering. And it's calling back to the, I think it's calling back to the sermon of the Mount, a sermon on the Mount of you, you cannot serve two masters building your house on the rock. It really is a conclusion statement, which I wish I could have gone more into, but I, I, I see a lot of parallels between this statement and the Jesus talking about the building your house on the rock versus the sand. Like he's saying that like the main point of this is about the effect of the wandering. It's, you know, he's, he's talking about that, that yes, he's in the context of someone being brought back, but he's saying, this is what you're saving them from. Like it matters a person, a person who wanders is wandering away and they aren't known by God. Like they're not, this isn't like someone wanders and you say like, well, nobody's perfect. You're saying, he's saying, listen, if somebody wanders away, they are going away from God. Right. And so, and they are departing from God. And so bringing them back is not just a matter of like doing a nice thing for them. Like it literally saves their soul. And so there's a weightiness to the wandering that is the main point. So this isn't a charge. And I think, you know, I could have clarified this too, but whatever, that's what a podcast is for. But I don't think this is a charge from James of like, hey, everybody, go find the wanderers. This isn't like a leave the 99 to go find the one kind of charge. This is just a, a, a heaviness of all these things that I've instructed you in really matter. This is about what kingdom you are a part of. Do you, if you believe, and if you are a part of God's kingdom, then your life will demonstrate that it'll show up in how you treat other people. It'll show up in, in how you, um, face trials. It'll show up in your character and your demeanor. And this is, this is the definition of what it looks like to live this life. And then at the end, if you wander, if anybody wanders away from living this life in the kingdom, you are headed for destruction. And so if a person brings them back, like he's just using that, I think, to illustrate the importance of wandering back and then a sense of response, communal responsibility. Does that yeah. make sense? So yeah. it's not a, yeah. it's not a like mission missionary charge. All right, everybody go find the wanderer. It's, it's not, it's not that it's yeah. a, this is the effect of wandering from this, what I've taught you. Right, 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 right. That, and that wasn't what I was, that was what I was trying to get. I was, I, I was more. Don't argue with me on a podcast. Of you're course I'm going to argue. I'm going to. You already slurred. Oh my goodness. The, what I was, what I was trying to say is twice. there's an implication. There is an implication and of, of, and exactly with what you said. Yeah. That that person was a part of this family 
to see them wandering. Right. Right. Like, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I would say that, like, what makes that that family then or what what like helps you to see when somebody is wandering is by being on mission together. So when I say being on mission, I'm not saying be on mission to like go and find all the people who have labeled themselves Christians on Facebook, but aren't living a Christian lifestyle and make sure to tell them that they are the worst. I'm not saying do that. What I'm saying is we are on mission together being salt and light. And while we are doing that, that's when we that's when we are holding each other accountable. That's when we are being responsible for one another in a way where we can can tell when we are wandering, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's that's where that's what I that's what I was saying with that. Of like Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't but, saying you weren't saying that, Christoph. This is gonna get really awkward. This is weird. <laughs> you you're straw manning yeah. me. I no, I was I'm just straw saying, you. I'm saying know. that yeah, that um that if I, I was trying to get across two main points, one is what is the thing I wanted to clarify, or at least it, it probably sounds funny to say clarify. Cause I often feel like I make things more complicated, what? Um, but like, I want to, I want to clarify what is the way that a person might be wandering from. So yeah. part of the issue is we don't notice wandering because we don't know what wandering is because we just allowed all kinds of cultural narratives to get meshed in with the gospel. So now all of a sudden it doesn't look like wandering when we are exhibiting greed or pride or gossip or any of those things that doesn't feel like wandering to us. So yeah, that's true. That yeah. is one big issue with the wandering is what does it, what what is what is like? Let's purify. Like all, all the listeners can see me holding out my hands. Right <laughs> you're, you're sitting here holding that. I'm like, there's, there's no video on you, Jay. No, What's... I know. But like, I'm just I I'm picturing like if whatever the the truth is, like the gospel and the and the kingdom, the truth about the kingdom, the proclamation of what the kingdom functions like, which again is Sermon on the Mount. This is what it looks like to be a part of the kingdom. So when James is talking about be you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That's an example of what it looks like when you belong to the kingdom. That's how you function. So he's clarifying, this is what the way looks like. And anybody who is not in that is wandering away from that. This, and so it's a little bit like, you know, the, the old illustration of to, for the people who are charged with um, finding counterfeit money that they know the real thing. That's how you train somebody to spot a counterfeit is yeah, to yeah. know the real thing so well that anything else that doesn't, that clashes with that makes you say like, Oh, that's not real. You don't have to know all the counterfeit things, like all the ways that people um, try to make counterfeit money. And then the same way I wanted to say, okay, if we're going to, if James is warning about wandering, we have to, we have to recognize what is wandering and it's away from this, that James has said, not away from what I have what our culture says is Christian or good or moral or ethical, not away from what I have formed for myself, but like, let's look at what James says. This is the way, and this is the, the, the way of the kingdom and wandering looks like that. So that, that is one thing that I wanted to clarify was let's know what it is that we're even looking at when we say someone is wandering, because otherwise you could say, well, that person's really wandered because they vote differently now, like, or whatever, like that's, that's not wandering. Right. I mean, it could be like, it could be a, it, it, underneath that could be, you might find wandering, but there's nothing, you know, in scripture that tells us how we're supposed to vote. Like that's a, but, but how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to view the world and how we're supposed to view other people and what our sense of responsibility, all of that, it does say things about that. So like, so that's one. And then the other is then, like you said, being responsible. Like, do I know people? Am I in community enough that I understand the power of this communal witness and the importance of it, that it matters if you're wandering, not only for your own soul, but for the communal witness. Like that's why the church takes it so seriously is because they know they're protecting a communal witness. This is one of the reasons why Paul says when somebody is sinning like that repetitively, why we have church discipline where he says, cast them out, but it's for both them and the good of the church, right? Like it's both, it's protecting the purity of the witness of the church, but it's also for that person's soul. Like he says, it's, it's better that you turn them over for the destruction of their flesh, that their soul might be saved. Like there's this idea that, that like that, that's the sense of responsibility we feel for one another. And if you don't, 
have that if church is just a place that you show up for your own personal growth and development then you're not going to you're not going to be a part of that communal witness you're going to you're not going to see yourself as that which means you're also not going to be a help to your brothers and sisters if they're wandering and they're not going to be able to be a help to you if you're wandering you know we always said like when we did house churches back in Colorado the best thing about house church is that we knew when people were wandering like, it's just obvious. You could see, you know, if they were struggling, if they were struggling in their faith, if they were struggling in their life or whatever, like we would see it because we sat around the table together. We were in each other's, you know, they were in our living room. We were in their living room. We saw them interact with their kids. We saw them interact with their spouse. We saw them interact with their neighbors. We saw them like, when we just see them, we're immersed in that. And we lose something when the only time we see each other is at corporate worship, you know, like, which is great that we want to see each other. We want to worship together. But if you're, if that's it, like if it's just, I show up and I sit in a row with these people and I go up and even I go up and take communion with them, that gives us a little bit more talking to people before and after gives you a little bit more, like all that gives a little bit more awareness. Um, But ultimately we have to be in each other's lives. And yeah, we have to be really intentional. I think that like, it's really easy you, know, you you bring up like the Sunday morning thing. It's really easy for somebody to just come in, sit on one corner of the room on a Sunday morning worship and not feel any sort of responsibility ever for somebody who sits on the opposite side of the room. Yet we are all family, right? And so the question then is like, how do we, how do we, and not everybody is going to feel that sort of responsibility for everybody in the church, but like, how, how do we, how do we cultivate those relationships where we do, or we are feeling responsible for one another, if that makes sense. And, and like, I think that we do certain things here at faith to help that, that, you know, when we do all church things and we're serving all together, I think that helps with those opportunities. I think things like taking communion together. I think things like getting, um, area lunch and connecting with people at area lunches, uh, trying to make connections outside of church, all those things go towards helping, um, you feel that responsibility that maybe you would get in, in a home church that you don't necessarily get um, on a, that, sorry, that you don't explicitly get from a Sunday morning because it's not in a more small, intimate setting. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's lots of studies about diffusion of responsibility and that's basically it. Yeah. If you're in a gathering of anything more than 50 to 70 people, you're not going to feel responsible um, for others. And if, if people don't know what diffusion of responsibility is, it's just the idea that the more people who are there, it's like you take, if, if, if you put a hundred percent responsibility, the, the more people that are there, the more that gets divided. And so if, if there are 10 people, if somebody sees somebody that needs help and there are 10 people standing around, I feel 10% responsible. If I'm the only person standing around and someone needs help, I feel a hundred percent, you know, responsible. Right. So that's I, oversimplifying it. So then when you're on a Sunday morning and that person that's sitting on the cross the room and there's hundreds of people there, like you're, you're just, the diffusion of responsibility is great. There's so many people between you and them. And if you don't even know them, like how in the world could you possibly take responsibility? And so then that backs us down into a place where then we don't take responsibility for anyone. And the question is always in any church is how do you help people figure out, well, then who should I take responsibility for? The problem with that usually is we end up looking for the people we want to take responsibility for. And then now we are getting into the categories of James talking about showing partiality. Yeah. Yep. So it's not just partiality of, Oh, I'm going to try to be nice to the rich and powerful person. It's also, yeah, I'm going to take responsibility for the people who are easy to take responsibility for the people that I like immediately hanging out with people. I have a lot of things in common with. There's a sense in which that's natural. And there's a sense in which it's partiality because if, if you only take responsibility for the people who are easy to take responsibility for, then you're immediately going to ignore the people that James says, this is true religion, like widows and orphans in, in that time were the people that nobody wanted to take responsibility for. Like if you're just going to have a draft of like, all right, we have so many people, everyone needs to have 10 people that they feel responsible for. So let's have a draft. Well, they were getting picked last. You're going to get, yeah, you're going to have, you're going to have some people there that aren't going to get picked. 
right. you know, and, and that shouldn't be the way it is. And so we have to figure out how do you, how do you create those environments? Like we know in, in culture, we have that with blood family. So they talk about like friends are the family you get to choose. you like, whatever. Well, that shows like a, a breakdown in society a little bit because it is designed like you take responsibility for the people that your blood related to that allows for the people who are hard to take responsibility for, right? Like, um, there's an old joke in small group ministry of every, every small group has, um, a, a person that requires extra grace. So it was like a term we would, sometimes we get used of extra grace, required. a little extra grace, yeah, extra yeah. grace required. Well, and then the joke, the, always the joke was every small group has one. If you look around and you don't see one, then you're it. Then you're it. Yep. And that's, it's kind of a funny way of looking at it, like, haha, that's all. That, but there's a, there's a reality to that. And there have been many times in my life where I have been the person that required extra grace. And how do you, how do you account for that? How do you actually like part of what made the church? So the, te- their wit- witness beat was so powerful was that they cared for people that the world said, like, why are you caring for them? Sometimes it was the least, like it was the people that had nothing to offer, but sometimes it was different ethnicities. It was like, why would the Jew and the Gentile care about each other like this? Whatever it was, the world looked at it and was like, well, that's weird. It's weird that you're giving your time um, for that, like, and for that person. And we do that because we're all made in the image of God. We're all image bearers and who we are here on earth is not who we're going to be one day. And the least are going to become the greatest. It's not even like a, it's not a, you know, a paternalistic patronizing kind of thing. It's like, no, Jesus says those who are the least are going to be the greatest. And so these are going to be the people that in heaven are going to have like the faith and, and, and be considered great. And, like, I don't really want to have been the one treating them poorly on earth or like thinking like, oh, you're kind of a nuisance or whatever. Like that's, that's not who they are. So I don't know. I get on, I get on that like little rant of trying to figure out like, this is the, this is the code that we try to crack and that churches have been trying to crack forever. And I, um, you know, area lunches are an effort to make that kind of mid size gathering where you can feel a sense of responsibility if there's consistency. Right. But then that's part of the thing is there has to be consistency. Right. Like if you show up to an area lunch once every two months, like you're not going to, you're not going to feel known and you're not going to feel like, you know, uh, you know, other people. Right. I, I, I have just found that, um, I was going to share, share this in, from the youth ministry perspective, one of the things I love, and it's just a, I feel like this is a common story. I know it's one that you've experienced before too, where you've had the person who somehow, they get roped into helping with like a specific event or something like that, that requires a little bit of attention and they see like the need to serve that specific age group. And, and then they're, they're just in, they're in on serving, they're in on being responsible for those people. They're in on like, on, on, on loving them and seeing them as like those to take care of. And like, just thinking back to that diffusion of responsibility, I was thinking like we have, you know, you, you could have a number of teenagers who are in worship on a, on a Sunday morning um, that you don't feel responsible for at all. And then you, you get an opportunity to be in a small group with them for an hour. Or maybe you like spend, you know, you come to disciple now or, or something like that. And you, you get to hear a little bit of their story and all of a sudden you're like, oh man, like I need to invest in this area. We've had that same thing with children's ministry. When we, we called people to help with children's ministry, we had, we had people who were like, wow, I really see this need and I see this need to be a part of it. And I, I, I think I just want to like encourage people to, to, to just, if you feel like you don't have anybody that you're responsible for, or you feel like you're not somebody who has those sort of people in your life to find an outlet to serve in one way or another. And I think like those relationships tend to happen. Like, I think that that tends to be a, I don't know, that tends to be a natural outcome for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I mean, I think a huge obstacle for people is, I mean, one, we have a fear of being known. So we all kind of craft our own little worlds that we're living in. And we just, don't we don't want anybody to mess with that and so that is a real thing in and we're trying to deal with that just as a church culture level that that again that's goes back to what james says yep, and so yeah. this is this is who we're called to be so if you've created your own version of this that is not in line with what james is talking about here then that's not who we are and so um so that's a that's a fear that some people have and we can i think we can deal with that at a bigger picture level but then people have a fear of being known people have a fear of commitment like 
we just have this idea that freedom is like total flexibility and having no obligations. And we've said before, and I try to tell my kids that I tell, like, if you have no, if you have no obligations, if no one, if you have total freedom, and if that to you means you don't ever have to be anywhere, you can be wherever you want, whenever you want, then that means no one's ever counting on you to be anywhere, which means no one is ever counting on you. Like no one would yeah. notice you being gone. And so I know that for you in youth ministry, for example, those volunteers, like they give up every Wednesday, you know, and I know because my wife is one of them and, and yeah, there are Wednesday afternoons where you're just like, I, you know, I would not mind a blizzard right now that would right. cancel this. And yet you, you wouldn't trade that like the impact that you're having. So, so the enemy wants us to be afraid of commitment and afraid of like, Oh no, then that means I'm like hedged in or whatever. Like, yeah. When people, when people count on you, that's, that's a life that has meaning, right? Like if, if nobody's ever counting on you for anything, then what, what's the purpose? Like what, what is your, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I like your purpose. And so, um, and, and I'm speaking to myself in that because I definitely wander towards wanting flexibility and freedom, but it's a lie. It's but it's not empty, freedom, right? It's like, not. I, I think it's, it's, it is funny to me how Paul uses the language of we are slaves to sin. It, like, I, I think that there's a truth to that. Like when we pursue worldly, free, quote unquote, worldly freedom or that flexibility, our tendency is to be insular. And that's oftentimes a breeding ground for temptation and for us to just, yeah, to, to not have anyone who counts on us. And, and I think there is such truth. To, I wish I would have wrote down what you just said. I'll have to go back and listen to it again. Cause it was, it was a really good Jay. It was really good of um, it, what's the point. If you don't have anybody who's counting on you, I can't remember how you, how you finished that, but like there is, there is such truth to that of, yeah, you wouldn't trade that when you, when you experience, when you experience that. And yeah, you do have those moments where you're like, man, it would be really great to have my evening or to have my whatever. But almost every single time, it is far more fruitful. Even in the nights where you leave discouraged, you look back on those nights and you you see weeks later or months later, like the importance behind that. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, there's it, no question that you, um, you know, like think about a wedding, for example. If you're going to a wedding, the flexibility and freedom would be that you don't RSVP until the end. But if you if you're able to do that, then that means no one's going to notice if you're there or not. And that's not really a life that's that we would say has a lot of purpose or meaning as opposed to if you're like the best man or the you know maid of honor or whatever, and you have all this responsibility and all this time that you're committing to it, but it's also your, it's, it matters like that you're there and like your, your presence and your effort and everything is appreciated and, and, it, and it matters. I think, I think we just, we have this fear of commitment. We have a fear of being inconvenienced. Like we just, and we miss out on the joy, the joy of being inconvenienced for the gospel is a, is a really, it's a powerful thing because if, if what we want is to go through and just like make things as easy as possible, well, easy is kind of pointless. And, um, but what we want is like, we want meaning, like we want purpose. We want our lives to matter. And we think that's going to come through no one ever expecting anything from us and yeah. never being inconvenienced. Is it, man, I love that illustration of the wedding thing too, because, because when you are asked to be a part of like the wedding party, or maybe you're asked to be like the, the best man or, or, or maid of honor, like it's going to cost you quote unquote, cost you things mm -hmm. that are like worldly things, time, money, like it's going to cost you those things, but nobody's full probably. Yeah. Like, yeah, well, a, yeah. You're going to have to be this person who like they're leaned on during this, like this season. And, but like, we don't look at that and we go, we don't go, Oh, that's such a bummer. Like what could you imagine if like we lived in a society where you you're like, Oh yeah, I got asked to be my, you know, my brother's, um, uh, yeah, uh, but I think we do do that. Haven't really? you ever heard somebody complain? Like you don't, when you get asked. So like when you get asked, it's a huge honor. Yeah. But haven't you ever heard anybody complain about like, oh, I got my brother's wedding next weekend and I got, I still have all this stuff. Right, that but they do, do that. They do that when they like, when they're attending and not when they're like the, not when they have some sort of like active involvement in it. Yeah. Well, I'm saying, I think that there's a time, I'm just saying like the misnomer is we end up, we also complain. We complain about our lives having meaning basically. We really like I just, yeah, I, yeah, we do. Yeah. We, we just complain and I think like, okay, well, what's the alternative? 
right? Like, so I found myself doing that of like just perspective, right? So I found myself on Saturday. I love college football. Okay. So yeah. Saturday though, I preach most Sundays. So that means Saturday evening is not like, it's not college football time. Right, it's not right. date night. It's like, I have to, I go to bed early. I have to like wind down. I have to make sure that I, you know, I, I want to, I'm, I'm usually going over my sermon prep and doing a little bit more on Saturday evening or whatever. And I have had the thought in my head of like, oh, I just wish like, why can't I watch college football game like a normal person? Now step back from that for a second and realize how normal mor- people don't watch college football, Jay. Well, okay. <laughs> but how, mor- <clears throat> how moronic is that statement? Yeah. That I, and I've, I've called myself on on that saying like, okay, so you would rather your life be about, you get to watch this random college football game that you don't even care about either of the teams. And that life is going to be one of, of more value and more meaning than the fact that God has given, has called you for whatever reason, has called you to be the person to proclaim God, his word tomorrow to your family. It's nonsense, right? And I, you know, I, I see that in people who volunteer and serve. Like I, we have a couple of people in our church. We have several people in our church that do this on a weekly basis where they give of their time. They give in a way that they are inconvenienced for the sake of the kingdom. And some of them do it in ways that nobody ever notices. Like we have people who go to the prison and go and share the gospel and they go like, we've got people who like right when they get off work, they go and they do that. And like when most people are thinking, I want to go home and, you know, put my feet up or whatever. Like we have people who are then going immediately to the homeless shelter or immediately to the jail. And I think that's really powerful. I saw it last night. I wish I could give more details of the illustration, but last night I'm literally able to, proclaim the goodness of God in his kingdom because somebody in our church was in a situation where they were choosing to be inconvenienced for the sake of the kingdom. Like people are looking at that person saying, why would you put yourself in this position? And the answer was because Jesus. Yep. Yep. And to be able to point to that and say, that's a really good question. Why would that person drive all this way when they have no, nobody, Like there's, they have no responsibility to do this, like no worldly responsibility, no reason outside of the kingdom. They're not getting any kind of kudos for this. Like it was a difficult situation, which is why people were wondering, like, why would you do that to yourself? Um, you, you get no, no immediate, no immediate gratification, no pat on the back, no nothing. Um, well, why? Cause the kingdom, like there's no other reason. There's no reason then you believe like you're storing up treasures in heaven and it's worth it because like the situation. I, so I, those are the kinds of things and that, that I, I just think are powerful when we, when we choose to be inconvenienced, we choose to, to commit to people, to loving people, you know, and to serving them and to being present. And to your point, like as a church, we try to do that as simply as possible. This is why we don't have a big, menu of all these programs and all these things, because that requires a lot of energy to, um, and time to put those things on basically to just, I don't, it's, it's, it's not what we're called fully to do. Like, I love it that we have people who study the Bible together, but we don't create a bunch of Bible studies for people to just be involved in. We want them to study the Bible together but we also want them to be in the community loving people and we want to equip them to to do that. And so we we try to make it really simple so that you're not overthinking and spending all your time wondering which which Bible study should I be a part of. So we just say, "Hey, come to area lunch." Like I don't know how much simpler we can make it of like if this is your community, you can go to any area lunch you want to. Like we're not, like like we say before, like we don't check IDs. You don't have to bring your utility bill to prove that you live in a particular area. Come to any area lunch yeah. we want. We're just trying to help you by saying, look, you don't know what to do. Once a month, stay after church, commit to it, commit to it for a year. That's that's twelve lunches after Sunday to just be there every time and to say, I'm going to invest in somebody. I'm going to connect with people. And I'm going to um, take responsibility for just being there and loving people um, who are there. 
and see what happens. And if everybody did that and just gathered together with the people in their community, shared stories and prayed together, like I think you'd be amazed at how much deeper a sense of community would be and how many, and then if, and then the idea was always off of those to have these offshoots where you might notice somebody that God has put, you know, across from you at lunch and you just say to them, you know, Hey, I, you know, maybe it's a, an older woman sitting across from a younger woman and just offering, um, you know, Hey, can we, let's get together for the next few weeks. Can I just, or can I come over to your house once a month and, you know, and, and watch your kids for you and then just so you can have some time, like whatever the case is, like out of that can, can come some really beautiful, um, discipling opportunities and encouragement. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's how we, that's how we, um, that's how we live as people called to, um, be what James has called us throughout, throughout the course of his, his letter. And I, I think, yeah, that's a great avenue is, is area lunch. Um, I, I would even challenge people to, one of the things I have loved is just spending time after church on Sunday morning, just, just talking with people, just, just sitting there and chatting with people. Um, but that, that's how we do it, right? That's how we cultivate those sort of relationships or opportunities to have that responsibility for one another, which, um, was, I mean, to me, and I think that was kind of what we were trying to talk about for, for this podcast was for me wrapping up James yeah. It was just the necessity of us doing this together. We are, this is, you, as you said, it is a team sport. Christianity is a team sport. We need to be doing this together. We need to be on mission together. We need to be caring for one another. We need to be loving one another. And uh, by doing that, we are able to do, when James does call us to um, bring back the one who is wandering, we're able to do that. When we are able to um, reach the orphan and the widow when we are able to uh, be those people it's when we are uh, doing it together not on our own yeah and you know what just to, before we land the plane here i thought of one other area where we could do this um and that is like where you sit on sunday mornings oh yeah so it's funny that i have a lot of people who say to me like oh, i'm trying to move around um you know and sit in different places so i can get to know different people I think that's great. If, if if that's your wiring and that's your gifting and you want to b- bounce around, do that. But there's also real value in the people who sit in the same places every time. And and I know that gets a bad, you know, a bad rap because of the old thing of like, oh, you have reserved seats and if you sit in somebody's seat, then they're going to get mad and I get that. And but that doesn't that's not happening. I think the the positive that can come out of it is you notice when somebody is new, like if you sit in the same place every time, then when somebody comes in and sits, then you know when they're new and when they're new, you can talk to them. And when somebody is always sitting in the same spot and then they're not there and they haven't been there for a while, you notice that. Mm -hmm. So, so I would just encourage you that if you are wired to be the person that likes to go around to other sections and, and get to know the people that are there, do it have total freedom. You, this is, this is why it's a team sport. Not everybody has to do what you do and you don't have to do what everybody else does. But if you are the type of person that feels really comfortable just being in the same spot and that, um, then be, be hospitable in that spot. Yeah. Right? Like, I, you, you've said that before of just owning it, right? Yeah, like absolutely. owning that area being, uh, I love the idea of being hospitable in that area. And then, yeah, like you said, to notice and take responsibility of those who are around you. I think that's, that's really beautiful. And that can be a really beautiful thing for those who just kind of have, do, do have their own little, not their own little section. I don't want to say that in a way that sounds like I'm downplaying. Cause I think that's beautiful. I think it could be a really cool thing. Yeah. It's well, and it's a great example of how we can show that in and of itself, it could be, it's, it's neutral. Like having your own section is in and of itself, like, is neutral. The question is, is it for Christ and his kingdom or is it for yourself? So right. if it's for yourself, that's when you get into the, like, this is my section. Yeah. If it's just for comfort, I don't, sake. Anybody, I don't want anybody else to sit here. I don't want anybody to sit in my row. I don't want anyone to sit in front of me. Like I always sit here and this is, that's, that's obviously perverted and sinful. But if you are seeing it as like, this is my section and therefore I feel a sense of responsibility to welcome the new person or to notice if somebody is, um, it, you know, is having a hard time during communion, for example, or struggling or whatever to put a hand on a shoulder to offer prayer or whatever. Like that's when that's a really beautiful thing for you to say, now I feel a sense of responsibility for these few rows, you know, around me. Um, that would be really incredible. So 
I don't know, we're going to keep trying to figure out ways to help people. And we just want to create environments for people. I can't, you know, we talk about this. We've started talking about this more and it's been really on my mind of, um, of like, we want the obstacles to that kind of community are often that people are afraid, um, or they don't know how, or they, do, they lack desire. And as a church family, we want to address those first two. We want to help people understand how they can connect and we want to give them courage to do so, to, to help them know, Hey, it's okay. You can come to the area lunch. No, it's not weird. Like you're not, no one's going to look at you weird. Like, why are you there or anything like that to give to, you know, to help people understand and to give them courage, but we can't address the desire. Like I can't make somebody want to be in community if they don't actually want to be God's word and the Holy Spirit can do that. That's why we proclaim it the way that we do and try to and and trust him with that and say like, this is the picture of the kingdom. And then do you want that? And that's a, that's a matter of the spirit transforming our heart and our desire together as a family. Yeah. I love it. I think it's a good place to, uh, to To land land that plane. All right. Well, uh, I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and looking forward now to starting Advent coming up on Sunday. So, um, Hopefully we will see you with us on Sunday morning. I hope this has been helpful. We're thankful that you took the time to listen. Until next time, grace and peace. Peace.